everyone. It is a great pleasure being here at TAG. So today I will talk about different kinds of human and non-human bodies being fragmented, being reassembled in the context of Mesolithic, Neolithic, Daniel Gorges in the Balkans. And also I will talk today about different environments inhabited by different beings and, and also different kinds of interactions these environments afforded. And uh, I will not talk too much about different approaches that we use uh, uh, in the study of human-animal relationships as they have been covered uh, today by the session organizers in more detail. But I will just say that I find great benefits in both of them, if we can talk about two approaches, really. But maybe one, uh, one can be grouped, perhaps. Um, so I, I, I think it's quite beneficial to combine them, to use them both, and this is something that I'm doing in my approach. Uh, on one hand, uh, a broad range of approaches uh, that also known as the animal turn uh, is very beneficial in that the centering the subject and moving away from anthropocentrism, uh, greater emphasis on the works of Donna Haraway, Anna Singh, and similar authors, um, a greater emphasis on animal ethology, human ethology, anthrozoology, social zoology, whereas uh, alternative ontologies, relational ontologies, um, in, uh, in, with their uh, greater emphasis on cultural anthropology um, and a greater emphasis on cultural contexts where the subject, human subject has never been centered in that way, also provide uh, useful and beneficial uh, views and insights into um, how different persons, humans, non-human persons, are constituted through uh, social relations and also um, their cor corporal aspects. Um, different kinds of effects that get encapsulated perhaps in different kinds of bodies and whether they can be transmitted to other persons using them. So I, I try to use both approaches and uh, hopefully I'm successful in that. So uh, moving on to the, to the context that I will be talking about today, the Danube Gorges refers to the section of the Danube between present-day Serbia and Romania in the Balkans. Um, it, um, and, uh, it, basically, it is a series of na deep and narrow gorges um, in the Danube Valley intersected by vast open basins. And here we can see that a number of uh, Holocene, uh, early Holocene uh, sites have been found in this region. Today I will, I will be mostly speaking about uh, Padina, Lepensivir and Vlasas in the upper gorge. And here is just a quick uh, uh, review of the chronology of the sites. Basically they have been uh, more or less continuously populated from the mid 10th to the mid 6th millennium BC. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here now about the sequence, but the initial phases of this Occupation can be, um, their manifestations are sporadic burials, some of them in seated, uh, uh, seated positions, um, occasional caches of uh, animal bones and tools. And with the uh, late Mesolithic, there seems to be a more, um, a more pronounced sedentism or archaeologically visible sedentism um, manifested in a proliferation of burials, dugout dwellings, and uh, greater reliance on fishing. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the w uh, mostly the, the best known are the so-called transformational uh, Mesolithic Neolithic settlements uh, of uh, mo the most famous being the one from Lepinski Vir on the bottom uh, photo, a uh, settlement consisting of numerous buildings of trapezoidal shape and these famous um, uh, Lepinski Vir sculptures uh, representing uh, human or human fish-like beings. So uh, I already mentioned that with the late Mesolithic, there seems to be a greater reliance on fishing and more time spent by these human groups on the, on the river, river coast. Uh, this is manifested in both the archaeological and the isotopic and archaeological evidence as well. So uh, jointly, uh, alongside with this greater reliance on fishing, there seem to be uh, new ways uh, fish uh, these human-fish relationships are materialized and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the forms that they are taking. Uh, for example, uh, these uh, a great number of burials uh, in, the Mesolithic, in the late Mesolithic Vlasas 
uh, we're containing these isolated pharyngeal teeth of a fish species of the Cyprinid family, Rutilus frezi. There is no English name, as far as I know. Um, so I use a, a Russian name, uh, Virezub, mostly because the fish uh, is populating the Black Sea, the Azov Sea, Caspian Sea, and the rivers draining to these seas. Um, so uh, these burials were namely uh, burials of uh, women, children, and occasional adult males. Uh, and as we can see on the lower photo, uh, some of these teeth uh, sh uh, have shown extensive traces of use. Uh, so uh, my colleagues, uh, Manuela Cristiani and Dusan Boric, have determined that they have in fact been uh, worn as clothing appliques, uh, fastened or attached to clothing. And some of them, with their extensive traces of wear, suggest that they have been shown, uh, that they have been worn over extensive periods of time. <coughs> Uh, which is uh, even more striking given that some of them have occurred at, in infant burials, which could not have produced such wear patterns in, such, in their short lifetimes. So obviously we can talk about uh, these uh, ornaments, these appliques being transferred from persons to persons, from maybe families to families, or particular persons uh, to particular persons. Um, and, um, and, the, and they obviously played uh, an important role. But what of the fish itself? What of the fish itself that uh, provided these ornaments? Well, uh, Rutilus frizi, or Virezub, is an anadromous fish. Um, it used to migrate in the Danube uh, in the early spring to spawn from the Black Sea. Uh, so it was not available to the Danube Gorgeous communities throughout the year. It was available to them only for a, a limited, um, restricted period of time. Um, what, but one of the uh, most interesting uh, aspects about uh, Virezub, which brought, uh, caught my attention, uh, was this uh, uh, sort of a pearly-like rash exhibited by males during spawning. So uh, since these fish enter the rivers to spawn, this is what their appearance would be like uh, for the uh, uh, inhabitants of the Danube Gorges. This is what they would know, this is what they would see. Uh, and certainly this kind of a, a specific appearance of the fish, um, here, here are also two drawings from two uh, 18th century manuscripts, which shows that this really uh, caught human attention in different cultural contexts. Um, this could have certainly enabled uh, um, uh, specialized fishing uh, possible, but also it would seem, uh, looking at the burial evidence uh, and the distribution of these teeth in burials, that this kind of appearance could have been simulated by humans. Um, so here uh, on the left are two reconst reconstructions of two burials from Lossets. Both of them had an enormous amount of teeth in their burials. Uh, it would be necessary to have 60 or uh, to catch 60 or 70 adult fish to produce these cloaks. And since the, all the teeth were located on the back, uh, well, uh, underneath the human bodies, um, it was hypothesized that these teeth were attached to some sort of cloak wrapped around the bodies of the deceased. Um, so it would seem that with this kind of patterning of teeth, that actually um, people were trying to imitate the, perhaps the spanning, uh, spawning rush of, the, of, uh, this, of breeding males. Um, and... Uh, also, an interesting feature concerning the Virezub teeth is uh, that the Danube Gorges is not the only location where uh, its teeth uh, used as ornaments occur. Uh, I, I compiled a map here showing that uh, the teeth of this very species during the Mesolithic has also been um, uh, worn uh, in the Upper Danube in Germany and Austria, uh, also in the Crimea, uh, and the Dnieper and Don drainages in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, in all these places, uh, this fish would have been available uh, locally, but uh, the meanings certainly transferred, um, uh, but the meanings transcended uh, local use. So possibly uh, there, there was a, a greater connectivity between Mesolithic communities in, and uh, in, in, in whose worldviews uh, Virezub uh, played an important role. Um, moving on, uh, it would seem that with the emergence of uh, more complex settlements, 
there seems to be a shift of emphasis towards other migratory fish uh, species. Um, Virus remains to be important, uh, it remains to be uh, uh, caught even in the transformational Mesolithic, uh, Neolithic settlements. However, it would seem that different kinds of fish and different kinds of uh, relationships are emphasized in these new cultural contexts. Uh, namely, this is when these uh, uh, sculpted boulders made of uh, sandstone appear. And whereas some of them are aniconic, have no, absolutely no uh, um, represented features of the human or non-human body, some of them are very deliberately done and made. And uh, especially this one on the left, which seems to have uh, features uh, of both human and sturgeon anatomy in terms of these uh, large downturned mouths and these rows of bony scoots uh, visible on the backs. Um, so um, colleagues like uh, Boric have um, elaborated that in terms, and he understood these diverse uh, features of uh, sculptures as uh, he understood them as volatile bodies, uh, being in a constant uh, 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 state of uh, shift shaping from human to animal, uh, both through hybridization and metamorphosis. But also to go back to the fish, another interesting aspect is these fish were massive. Like the, uh, the greatest the specimen, uh, the beluga sturgeon, uh, represented on the, on the lower photo with Russian fishermen on the Volga, could have attained impress uh, impressionable size, uh, five, six, seven meters in total length. And the, the specimens caught in the Danube Gorges uh, could attain uh, impressive sizes as well. Uh, we, we did some uh, regression uh, uh, we employed some regression uh, formulas to estimate the size of the fish on the basis of preserved bones, and the larger specimens would have been around five or six meters in total length. So one can only imagine the effect of uh, these uh, large uh, uh, migratory fishes coming back each year uh, at the same time, and the effect uh, it uh, made uh, in human communities. Uh, and finally, uh, to uh, step out of the water domain and go into the uh, forest domain, which was encompassing the sites, um, there seems to be in the also another emphasis on different kinds of bodily transformations related to terrestrial animals as well, namely uh, the aurochs and red deer. Um, there seems to be... Okay, should I wrap it up? Oh. <laughs> okay, um, but I can but I can continue talking, <laughs> just so I, I don't waste too much of your time. Um, so, <laughs> um, so in terms of aurochs and red deer, both were available uh, to the Daniel Gorges communities. Uh, red deer, perhaps more. Um, it was common on all archaeological sites in the Daniel Gorges. It inhabited the dense forests surrounding the sites. Whereas um, uh, remains of aurax were fewer, um, this is a species that mainly inhabits the forest steppes, so not the immediate vicinity of, uh, of the Daniel Gorges sites. Um, however, they seem to be used in similar ways, but I would say to emphasize different things. Um, for example, per, uh, perhaps most striking is this burial here uh, on, the, on the left photo, because it shows the body of a complete human individual joined uh, by um, a skull of another human individual and a skull of, a, of an aurochs. And uh, I would say this is where I employed a bit of uh, Vivero's, this Castro's uh, perspectivism, because it was this burial kind of, to me, screamed different perspectives. Um, uh, all of these skulls are oriented in different uh, directions. And uh, perhaps this composite being can be understood uh, as a new kind of being which can incorporate all these different perspectives. Um, also, uh, other burials, such as this one on the right with the Oroch skulls, um, could have conveyed something different, perhaps, because um, whereas in the first case we might talk about uh, composite beings, it would seem that the other person perhaps went underwent the process of transformation um, as it already has uh, Aurochs horns. 
Um, on the other hand, um, the woman on the on the lower right photo was accompanied by a uh, red deer antler, and that is shed red deer antler, which could suggest uh, a more flexible relationship, a different kind of a relationship, a relationship that enabled the wearer to shift between identities perhaps more freely. Um, what would be the reason uh, of choosing either horns or antlers? Well, certainly uh, the context of interaction would be crucial. Um, surely red deer could have been hunted and killed. But on the other hand, their shed antlers could have been uh, collected as well. Whereas in the case of aurochs, uh, of course, they would have to be removed from the animal post-mortem. So I don't want to ascribe some universal uh, unease or dramatic uh, emotions related to kill. But certainly we are operating here with different uh, kinds of interactions which certainly influenced the way different um, body parts were used and valued. And uh, finally, and this is my last slide, um, the last uh, domain that I will talk about is the settlement itself. And the only animals that were closely related to human settlements were the dogs, and there are some indications that they have been domesticated already in the early Mesolithic. Um, so uh, on these two uh, field sketches, this is all I have. Unfortunately, I don't have any um, <coughs> photos. But uh, in these couple of cases, uh, there has been um, a do articulated dog skeleton without a skull. And skull removal was something that was practiced when humans were concerned. And in another case, there has been a dog mandible, mandible placed on the chest of uh, this complete human being. Um, so, uh, in a way, I would say perhaps uh, we should understand dog parts and dog mandibles in this uh, particular context, similarly to human mandibles, which were also uh, occasionally structurally deposited in this context, as remains of orifices related to uh, communication. Um, so, um, and especially if we uh, go back and uh, uh, I know the Juliet Clotten-Brock writes about this, um, some of uh, the sounds the dogs made, like barking and yapping and baying, are not the sounds that are produced by wolves in the wild. They're a process of cohabitation with humans. So, per and uh, also these um, uh, uh, smiling dogs, uh, in a way, their they're upturned mouths to, to perhaps simulate a human facial uh, mimicry. So perhaps uh, the choice of dog mandibles in this case has been similar to using human mandibles uh, as a uh, means uh, to communicate. And uh, so I, I'm aware that I'm uh, past my time, so I would like to thank you for your attention. And any questions or comments are welcome. Thank you. Thank you.